The Fed stress test results of the 18 largest U.S. banks. They are now out. Chief Washington correspondent Peter Cook has a look at some of these details. Uh, and again, Peter, this news just crossing. Just crossing right now, the main headline, Trish, under the Fed's severely adverse stress test scenario, a deep recession and basically a repeat of the financial conditions in late 2008. 17 of the 18 firms evaluated by the Fed had at their worst point under this scenario minimum tier one common capital ratios that exceed the 5% regulatory minimum uh, set by the Federal Reserve and a key measure, of course, of financial strength. And that shows how far the biggest banks have come in terms of their capital position could reassure markets about the health of the financial sector at this point in time. Now, the one firm below that level, auto lender Ally Financial, still majority owned by U.S. taxpayers. Next lowest on the list, Morgan Stanley at 5.7%, Goldman Sachs at 5.8%, followed by J.P. Morgan Chase at 6.3%, Bank of America 6.8%. All again above that sort of magic 5% level that you'd be looking for. Other biggies here, Wells Fargo at 7%, Citi at 8.3%. Again, the Scenario. Let me walk you through here. They were tested against a very deep recession. 12.1% unemployment, home prices down 21%, commercial real estate down 21%, a 52% plunge in stocks. Basically, a two year economic picture we have not seen since the Great Depression. And the big picture here, in terms of uh, how all these 18 firms combined would have fared, again, total projected losses under this scenario would have been $462 billion. The tier one common capital for uh, the fourth quarter of 2014 would be at 7.7 percent compared to today's number, which is 11.1 percent. And just as a perspective here, in Q4 of 2008, that number at 5.6 percent. Very important to remember here, nobody passes or fails based on this stress test, but it does matter and it gives us a clue as to who might be in trouble next week when the Fed releases the results of a second stress test that evaluates these firms and factors in their capital plans, stock buybacks and dividend distributions. That's what really matters to a lot of investors. What the banks learned today and what we didn't is whether their proposed capital plans don't meet the Fed's test. If they didn't, they now have the next week to modify their plans. So we cannot say with any certainty that any of these firms, including Ally, will fail next week. But we can certainly see who has some work to do and who, Trish, might be on the bubble. That is basically what this stress test result will tell us today. And uh, Again, a lot of anticipation about next week's stress test, but that's the results uh, for this first round from the Fed. Okay, and it looks like for the majority anyway, good news. Peter Cook, thank you very much for more on these stress test results. We're joined by Larry McDonald, Senior Director of U.S. Credit, Equity, and Policy Strategist at New Edge USA, and Fernando de la Mora, PwC's Head of Banking and Capital Markets Risk Practice. All right, so first of all, your reaction, Larry. I mean, Ally, the only one that missed. Um, good news? Well, I think City's, City looked uh, promising in terms of their number, and they've had about 110% dividend growth over the last year. Bank America is about 60% dividend growth. They also look pretty good in terms of the numbers. So I think both City and Bank America In other words, they're promising. paying money out, and in spite of paying money out, and in spite of incredibly onerous conditions imposed by the stress test, they're looking pretty good. They're looking, I think, the, both of those companies are a little bit better than expectations, I believe. Okay. The, your sense of the industry as a whole here, does it, does it look fairly healthy? It, it, it looks very much as we were expecting. Uh, again, the starting point of the industry was 11% of tier one common. The dilution that the stress test creates is 330 basis points, taking down the tier one to 7.7. .7. That leaves us a lot of capital flexibility. Last year, that ca capital flexibility was 50 basis points. Today, with these results, the capital flexibility is 150 basis points. So I would expect to see uh, dividend increases uh, being announced next week. Dividend increases. Well, you also have to look at what have the equities have been doing going into this. So the, uh, you know, Goldman Sachs has had stellar performance going into this. Mm -hmm. um, Key Bank today was up 2.5%. Right. Uh, Capital One was down almost 30 basis points. So it's a lot of gamesmanship's going along. So be careful, investors. You know, a lot, some of this has been priced in, and some is actually underpriced. Well, but Fernando, you just really hit the nail on the head. In other words, the banks, 17 out of 18 have passed, and they've done so with flying colors, which means they are likely, in your opinion, and I think, Larry, you as well, to up their dividends next week. Is that right? I think the word passing is a little bit premature, okay? We need to pass the Tier 1 common of 5% after applying the dividend ads that the banks would have applied to. 
those dividend asks have not been released today. So there's, there's some room, room right. for uncertainty there. There's also one aspect that is not included in today's announcement, which is the qualitative adjustments that the Fed could apply to these results based on the evaluation of their capital planning processes. So that could also create some uh, differences in terms of grading next week. That's a little bit of the difference between today and next week. What do you think it's going to look like next week? Well, I think we'll definitely see some surprise dividend announcements. Um, I think the analysts right now, as we speak, are working. Tomorrow morning, we'll see lists. Uh, we'll see reports. I think also. In other words, all the banking analysts will say, here's what I think will happen on the yeah. dividends next week. Here's my best guess. Yes. Boom, boom, boom. And, and I think we've been advising clients, um, partnered with ACG Analytics on Washington policy. This Fannie and Freddie bill that's coming through Congress, a big part of the securitization revolution is the banks don't have any room on the balance sheet. So back in 2006, 2007, the reason GDP was so strong was banks had plenty of room in the balance sheet. Banks could securitize loans. I think you look at this. Do you this, think that's in part because of these, these capital ratios? I mean, are, are, we, are we asking too much of the banks? Well, I think that if you get a Fannie and Freddie uh, bill that fixes Fannie and Freddie over the next year, and this stress test opens the door for maybe banks having a little bit room on the balance sheet, uh -huh. it, br it opens the door for another leg up on housing later in the year. Why? Make that connection for because us. Because securitization right now. In other words, ah, securitization. So the banks that have loans on the books can then send them to Fannie and Freddie. They get securitized into bonds. It frees up capital. Frees That's up the capital. Link. What's Got remarkable it. about this housing recovery, I was telling clients about this this morning, 40% of of, of, of home transactions have been cash deals. So we're back in like a 1950s housing, 40% cash. Back in 2006, 2007, it was 15% right. cash. Right. So we're, we're back, we're Ozzy and Harriet days right now. Yeah, in terms if, of, if, if you don't have the cash or you can't write the <laughs> yeah. check, don't buy it, right? Right, but how much of that do you think, Larry, is a result of um, the banks having, having to, to adhere to, to new standards, such as what we're talking about here with these stress tests? A lot of it, but the biggest part is securitization. Uh, if you look back at the housing boom, in 2006 we had $800 billion of securitized loans. Um, a lot of that was bad. 50% was bad. 50% right. was good. You bring back the good stuff, housing will get a second leg. But How do you know that you're just bringing back the good stuff? Oh, because uh, first of all, a lot of the bad guys have been pushed out of business, so capitalism to some extent is working. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that there's so much regulation this regard the regulations up probably 50 60 percent so that whatever comes back will be good for at least for the first two three years and for investors it's good news for the banks it's good news for the banks long term if the banks can use their if balance sheet. fact yeah using their balance sheet yeah. and able to loan out yeah, let's get the banks back to using their balance sheet a little bit more Fernando um, your 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 just knee-jerk reaction here um, you, you happy with these results yeah. I mean, if you think about it, this is the fourth round of stress tests that the banks are going through. Uh, if you rewind to round one, in that round, it was all about capital raising activities. Seven banks had to raise capital. Round two, which was 2012, only one bank had to raise capital. Seven banks distributed capital. I expect that that number in this new round will be even higher. So I think uh, it demonstrates that the industry uh, has improved from a asset mix, asset quality, and credit performance. The capital buffers are greater. I think, as I indicated before, the, the next step and the, and the to do for the banks is really to return to ROE levels that are sustainable. The ROE level of the industry today is 8%. That barely meets the cost of capital of the industry. So going forward, I think the uh, the lesson uh, learned and, and, and the to-do for the banks is really to optimize that return on capital. Okay, Fernando de la Mora, Larry McDonald, thank you very, very much.